Good morning, everyone. One week to go. <laughs> welcome to our service this morning, Sunnybank. Very special welcome to the Reverend Rob McKenzie and his wife Jenny. And friend. Um, we're going to induct Rob a little bit later on in our service for the intentional interim role, so that's exciting. We're preaching today on John chapter 21, and uh, we'll have the announcements after our opening breakout. Let me pray, and then let's commence our service. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege we have to gather together. We come together in the name of the Lord Jesus. We ask, Lord, that you would assist us by your spirit to worship you, to honour you, to glorify you to listen to you, and to commit ourselves to being obedient to you. Receive, Lord, our love and our praise, now in Jesus' name. And everyone said? We're going to invite you all to stand with us as we uh, bring the praises and songs to our Lord the Father, and welcome you at home as well on the, on the video joining us. Thanks, guys. Let us lift our voices this morning, lift our praises to him. Clap if you want. Lift up your voices and lift up your praise. Join with the heavens declaring the wonders of His faithfulness forever. Sing of the victory, the hope of the world. The Savior has risen, the Spirit has come to bring us into love forever. People of God with the freedom of hope in our hearts, how great is the love of the Father. Lifted from darkness and into the light, the sons and the daughters and love and a price, how God has made us His forever. How great is the love of the Father. Oh, we are the people of God with the freedom of hope in our hearts. How great is the love of the Father. This is the song of the redeemed, the ransom and the Given life at such a price This is love, this is love And when the Father calls us home And we see Him on the throne Hear the voices sing as one This is love, this is love Oh, we are the people of God Justice, 
Turn your eyes to the screen, then uh, let's have, we'll go through our announcements. And then if you weren't here at the beginning of our service, then certainly welcome. But today's a special day because we're going to be inducting the new intentional interim senior pastor, Rob McKenzie, who's over here with his wife, Jen. We're going to do that straight after these announcements. If you can smell smoke in the building, uh, we had that imported because I want to preach on hell and brimstone. <laughs> Uh, the guys are cooking potatoes in the kitchen and the smell is just going to get worse. <laughs> so it's going to be difficult to concentrate, and about you, but for me. <laughs> so we might just cut the service short so we can uh, enjoy carols. Carols is on tonight. Here we go with the announcements. Um, five o'clock this afternoon we start, so pray that it doesn't rain. It was predicted to rain yesterday, it's predicted to rain tomorrow, it's not predicted to rain today. Let's trust that that will happen. 
Um, so at 5 o'clock we start with the fair. At 6.30 we have a children's uh, expert, minister, leader uh, coming to minister particularly to the kids. That's at 6.30. And then at 7 o'clock our carol starts um, and goes for about an hour, just maybe five minutes over or something like that. Commend that to you. Five o'clock this afternoon, please be in prayer for that, for all the setting up, for all of the organisation of it, and then for the community to come and for God to do something special. Pray for me too, because I'm doing the gospel talk as well, for a short talk. Next. Our Christmas services, please note this, Christmas is on Monday this year, and so Christmas Eve, the Sunday, we have a combined morning service, that's at 9.30 for the English Our Chinese brothers and sisters will have their normal service times, but we're combining ours. So 9.30 and 5.30 Christmas Eve, and the same on New Year's Eve, the following Sunday. So for those two Sundays, there's just one morning service. And then on Christmas Day, it's an 8.30 service. Um, And you might pray for Rob, particularly, because he'll be leading a lot of those. Pastor David is away this week, but he'll be back uh, soon. He's out west outreach. He'll be back and he'll also be uh, taking some of those services for us. So I commend our Christmas services to you. Invite your friends and families and celebrate together. Next, we have uh, a special card. Pastor Alvin has put this together. It's a little business card. So you can see it amplified there on the screen or this is in my hand. You can get a copy of this in the foyer. It's simply a business card you can put in your wallet. It has our service times on it. It's in English on one side and Chinese as well. There's a little map with our buildings and it's got the bus routes on it. It's got a QR code. It's only 20 bucks. <laughs> uh, it's not. So grab a handful, grab two or three, put them in your wallet. And it's really for you. As you meet people and they say, what church do you go to? We'll pull out a card and say, take my card and give it to them and invite them to come along. It's a great idea. If you would like one of those, you can grab one of those at the end. And then finally, well, that was a bad choice of words, wasn't it? (laughs) Apparently we're leaving. That's next week. It's a combined service also. It's an 8.30 service as a normal time. Um, And our Mandarin brothers and sisters will join us. And then we have morning tea, and then it'll be an 11 o'clock service, not our normal 10.30 time slot. That's to allow more time for uh, eating and um, hugs and kisses and all that sort of stuff. Um, People keep asking us, what are we going to do? We don't know. Where are we going to go? We don't know. Um, We have to move churches, which is sad, but the easiest thing for us would be to stay right here, wouldn't it? Uh, but QB guidelines are that we have to vacate for a period of time um, and so we need to go find a new church. So pray for us in that search. Um, Probably try the Catholics or something, I don't know. (laughs) Don't know. Uh, Pray for Rhonda as well. She'll have a full-time husband at home (laughs) under her feet. She is very committed that I find something to do out of the house. (laughs) Next week, our final farewell. Uh, Yep, I think that's the end of our announcements. Leona. Wow, so it's really happening. They're really leaving. It's going to be really sad. Um, I'm Leona. I have the privilege and the responsibility of uh, serving on the church board. It's been a really challenging year for the board, to be honest. Um, I must confess that uh, as I watched Daryl's retirement inch closer and closer, I had significant anxiety about what was going to happen next. Um, What was God's plan for Sunnybank? And who was going to lead us through uh, into our next chapter? Of course, as always, there was nothing to worry about. God had it all planned. It was just my faith that wasn't big enough. So it's my very great pleasure and privilege to extend a huge welcome on your behalf to Rob McKenzie and his wife Jenny. Rob's going to be filling the position of intentional interim pastor for the next 12 months or so. As a church, we're going to take time to pause, reflect and prepare ourselves for what God has got next for us. And Rob's role is going to be to guide us through that process. So let me be very, very clear 
Rob is not a placeholder until the next guy comes along. The next 12 months is an intentional time for the whole church community to reflect on our past, to rediscover our identity and our mission, and to prepare for the amazing future that God's got planned for us. And Rob is going to be guiding us through that process. And at the same time, he's going to be filling the role of acting senior pastor. So he's going to have a really busy year. Make sure you pray for him and his wife, Jenny. I'm going to hand over to Rob in just a second or so, so he can tell you a little bit more about himself. But um, Rob's not one to blow his own trumpet, so I'm going to do a bit of trumpet blowing for him. <clears throat> Rob is very, very highly regarded. He's very well trained and he's very experienced. He's filled the role of intentional interim several times previously in churches in Victoria. He's got over 30 years of pastoral experience and over 20 of those years were as a senior pastor. He also spent several years as a part-time lecturer at the um, Baptist Theological College of Queensland, which is now known as Malian. And he and Jenny also spent several years as missionaries and the senior pastor in Fiji. In fact, in 2015, while uh, Rob and Jenny were in Fiji, they invited Sunnybank to send a contingent to run Kids Club there. So SDBCers already have um, a bit of a connection with the Mackenzies. And also, speaking of uh, SDBC connections, some longer-term SDBCers may even remember Rob from his days as his student pastor here at Sunnybank back in the 80s. At our members meeting a fortnight ago, the members overwhelmingly affirmed the board sense of God's leading that, God, that Rob is his man for Sunnybank in this next season. So the board is thrilled and delighted to introduce Rob and his wife Jenny to you. Obviously, it's not a sin to tell lies from the pulpit. <laughs> That's not me. Someone asked me earlier when I first came, what do we call you? Well, I insist on being called Intentional Interim Pastor Rob. <laughs> what a gobful. Thank you for making me feel welcome with all these empty seats in the front. Um, I don't spit that far. What do you call me? Call me Rob because that's my name. Uh, my name's Robin. Does anyone remember Johnny Cash's song, A Boy Called Sue? That's how I felt growing up. A boy called Robin. If I had a dollar for every time, I've got to tell, back when I was this big, I was a carrot top. I'm a orangutan, okay? I'm one of those. And I would hear every day, multiple times, this little thing the kids at school would sing to me. Little Robin Redbreast sitting on the thistle, sat upon a thorn, pricked his bum and then began to whistle. If I had a dollar for every time that was said to me, I'd be a millionaire. So call me Rob, please. From this age, when I was called Robin, it's only when I'm in trouble. I'm Rob the rest of the time. So when you come to me, if you call me Rob and I know where we stand, if you call me Rob, we're okay, all right? I am, oh, confession's good for the soul. I'm currently living with a married woman. <laughs> I've been married to her 54 years in two weeks' time and a bit. I think on the 19th. We have five children, one boy and four girls. So if I stink, well, that was because of back then I couldn't get a shower. <laughs> we have two children living in Brisbane, two in Victoria, one in Tasmania. So they're all over the place. It's a real privilege to be, to be able to spend time with you. When you get to my age, I mean, you saw how long it took me to get up the steps, do you? Yeah. You don't get many opportunities apart to go and speak now and again. So thank you for that. Thank you for the trust you've put in me. And I want to assure you that I'm not here to put my feet up and boost my superannuation. I'm here to do what I can. I'm here to serve you in whatever way I can. I have an open door policy. If I'm there and the door's open, come. You don't have to have an appointment. Just come in. Um, and remember, Robin or Rob, so I know where we're going, okay? What else am I supposed to say? That it? Yeah, thanks. 
<clears throat> um, I just have a couple of questions that uh, I need to ask uh, Rob and also Jenny. <clears throat> so firstly, Rob, do you believe that God has called you to this pastoral role here? At yes, Sunday? I do. With God's help, do you promise to faithfully teach and preach God's word? Yes, I do. With God's help, will you guide the SDBC church family through this period of reflection, discovery and preparation? With God's help, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Under God's guidance, will you endeavour to be a leader of leaders, faithfully guiding and encouraging the pastors and ministry leaders? Yes. And under God's guidance, do you promise to pray for, encourage and support the family here at SDBC? I do, but not by name yet. <laughs> <laughs> now, Jenny, do you also promise to pray for, encourage and support the family here at SDBC? I do. Do you also promise to pray for, encourage and support Rob as he seeks to exercise his ministry here at Sunnybank? I do. Awesome. <laughs> You're both in. <laughs> So just as Rob and Jenny have declared their commitment to SDBC, um, we likewise have an obligation to them. We need to commit to praying for, encouraging and supporting Rob and Jenny. So can I invite you all to stand, symbolising your commitment to do so? And I'd also like to invite um, any representatives of the church leadership, so anybody from the board, the pastoral team, management team, any ministry leaders, any representatives from the Chinese congregations who are here today, thank you for making the time. Um, and Daryl's just going to pray for, for Rob and Jenny. We're going to pray for Robin, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we stand here in your presence grateful, grateful for your goodness, grateful for this man and his wife Jenny, grateful Lord that you have brought him here before I conclude. Thank you Heavenly Father for his experiences, for his availability and for his heart. We pray that you would energise him, empower him, that you would anoint him with your Holy Spirit and give him wisdom for the tasks that are ahead. We believe, Lord, he is the man that you have placed here for this purpose, so we pray that you would achieve your purposes through him and Jenny. We commit them to you, committing ourselves, Lord, to intercede for them and to uphold them uh, in your presence, and we ask particularly for your protection against the fiery darts, the evil one. Lord, we lovingly thank you and commit these guys to you in Jesus name and everybody said Amen. thanks Rob there was a principle established in the Old Testament as a part of the sacrificial system that said without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sin and that principle is carried right over to today. Without the shedding of blood, there was no forgiveness of your sin or mine. So Jesus had to come to die in our place. He had to shed his blood and give up his life so that we could be reconciled to God. And that's what we're going to do now as we share communion together. And how you get the tops off these things, I've never worked out. So you might want to try now. Didn't work. I'm going to try this bit. Ah, give it up. While I reading, Jesus took bread and when he'd given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body. Father, we thank you that Jesus willingly gave up his body for us. Father, as we eat this bread, Father, help us to remember what you went through for the forgiveness of our sins. Father, strengthen us. Help us, Father, be willing to give our body to each other as we worship you. Thank you, Jesus, 
for the bread we pray in Jesus' name. Then Jesus took a cup, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Father, thank you for the blood that earned our forgiveness. Thank you, Father, that as we drink this cup, we remember your horrible death on the cross. Father, what a price to pay. What a saviour. Father, we have so much to thank you for. Let us drink together and remember Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Let's come together in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your amazing gift of your Son. As we celebrate this time of Advent, that Jesus came as a baby to grow into a man so that we could get a glimpse of you and to show us how we can be more like you. Lord, we pray today for our carols that many will attend and that we can hear and they can hear your story and that we can share in a small way to be representatives of you there today. Lord, we're so blessed to be part of this church family. Lord, we just thank you for your blessings upon this church here and for all those that work in it, Lord. We're grateful for the work of the volunteers here, especially for tonight. Enthuse them, give them energy. And if we're available to help today, Lord, touch us, remind us, and help us to be able to serve you there. We pray for those that are unwell, for Peter, who's in hospital at the moment, and for those who have suffered loss recently, that your spirit will sustain them. Lord, as we go into a time of change, guide and direct us. Give us peace in changed circumstances. Be with Daryl and Rhonda as they move forward with you into retirement and into new paths. We pray for Charlie and Eleanor and the girls as they make their move south. Go before them, direct and care for them. We pray for our new pastors. May we be embracing and supporting as they guide us in this new era. Lord, we praise you. And just thank you for your love and support for each one of us, our families, and at Christmas time, and always. May we find you amongst the busyness and excess around us at this time. We love and adore you, Lord. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you all to stand with us again. It's um, a couple of songs that we're going to share with you and bring you together and give a thousand hallelujah to our Lord Father. Thanks. Who else 
would die for our redemption whose resurrection meets our rise there isn't time enough to sing of all you've done and I have eternity to try with a thousand hallelujahs we magnify your name you alone deserve the glory the honor and the praise Lord Jesus this song is forever yours a thousand hallelujahs and a thousand Sneak in that carol song this morning for you. Okay. Thanks, guys. Angels, we have heard a high, sweetly singing all the plains and the mountains in reply, echoing the joyous strains. Glory, 
Christ whose birth the angels sing. Come adore on bended knee, Christ the Lord, the new one King. This morning, the Bible reading is from the last chapter of John, of uh, Gospel of John. It's John 21. We start from verse 15 to the very end of this chapter. The NIV title states, Jesus reinstates Peter. Verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than this? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who has leaned back against Jesus in the supper, in the supper and has said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that the disciples would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his tes testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. This is the word of God. Yes, Before we jump into this passage, I'd like to invite Donna, if she comes. Donna is uh, 
a member of our church and she attends the 10.30 service usually. Um, school teacher who uh, also teaches RI and Donna is the author of a book and the book is called Thinking of You. It's a beautiful book, it's very well, lovely coloured and photos and it's filled with stories and anecdotes and parables and reflections and things like that. So why did you write it? Very good, very good question. Is this working? Yes. yes. Very good question. <clears throat> it's not for the money. Um, I wrote it because I wanted a gift book that I could give to non-Christians that was subtle enough to get them to read it all the way through and yet um, contained scripture and references to scripture that would enable them to get a glimpse of the gospel. I also wanted them to be able to um, demythologise the, the, some of the, the lies that are out there in, in, in society, for example, that you can earn your way to heaven. Um, and on a personal note... Um, my parents, when I was writing this, were non-Christians. My dad was dying and my, and my mum was getting frail, uh, frailer and frailer and I couldn't stand the thought of them living separated from God forever. Um, so I wrote it with them in mind. So that's why I wrote it. And they've been... <clears throat> your dad got to read some of it, I think. And dad read all of it. Oh, okay. Did he come to faith or we don't know? We don't know. Okay, so we hope. And mum has read it or had it read to her? Yes, I've read it to her. Yep. And mum at some point has made a commitment to the Lord Jesus. Yeah, and she's yep. struggling a little bit with health and yep. dementia and things now. But we nonetheless have hope. It's a very well-written book. It's beautiful. There are 31 just like the number of days in a month. So yes, that's right. Deliberately to read one a day, personally, or even as a family or a couple like that. Um, like I said, it's, it's very beautifully done. Lovely print, lovely colours. And it's only forty nine ninety five. <laughs> yes. Today, special, $10, just for you. <laughs> it's not forty nine ninety five. If you would like one, it's an excellent Christmas gift. It's an idea. Uh, fellas, if you haven't thought of something for the missus yet, here is a winner. Um, there are a few copies available over here, and if we run out today, then we, of course, can order more and get more printed. Mm -hmm. But our hope is to distribute these, all of these as best we possibly can. It's great for, for, for teachers, great, great for older people, you know, Christmas presents, you know, that sort of thing. Thinking of you is for thoughtful people, for real people, it's for fair income people, and it's for people to, um, will you come on this adventure one day at a time? What do you think? Very well done. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you for Donna. Thank you for her heart. And thank you, Lord, that you will take this material and use it, just like you have already. So, Lord, we commit the distribution of the book and the achievement of your purposes and your blessing upon Donna and her mum. We ask and pray in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, you better have that back. See ya. Peter, loving and following Jesus is where we're going to go this morning. Before we do that, how about we pray again? Heavenly Father, thanks for your word. Help us to understand it. Most of all, Lord, help us to understand what you want us to do about it. Help us to listen this morning amidst the distractions. Uh, help us to hear your voice. Lord, again, we ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Loving and following Jesus. Peter's had a rough six months the last six to 12 months. He keeps making blunders. On the Mount of Transfiguration, he's the one who suggested, Lord, it's great that we're here. Can we build some tents and just stay here? <clears throat> Jesus said he was going to Jerusalem where he would be betrayed and killed. And Peter took him aside and said, Lord, that'll never happen to you, not on my watch. To which Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. 
Uh, Peter, rather probably proudly one day, came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often do I have to give my buffet brother? Seven times? And he was probably quite thrilled with the idea of seven times. And Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. Peter is the one who confessed, Lord, we've left everything to follow you. What's in it for us? What are we going to get out of this? When Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem in that last week, Peter must have thought this is it. But Jesus turned left and went to the temple, not right, to the fortress of Antonio. Jesus didn't come to throw the Romans out. Jesus came to die on Calvary's cross, as Rob has already led us at communion. And then it's every day, backwards and forwards, from Jerusalem to Bethany, Bethany back to Jerusalem, until that Thursday, where in the upper room the Lord Jesus says, one of you will betray me. To which Peter proudly, arrogantly says, well, they might, but I won't. I'm ready to die for you and I'm ready to go to prison for you, if need be. Peter corrected him. Peter, or Simon actually he calls him. Satan has requested to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. When you turn again, implying he's going to fall, when you turn again, help your brothers. And that very night after Peter had boasted about his loyalty, Jesus informed him that this very night you will betray me, you'll deny me three times before the rooster crows. And then there's the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus says, watch and pray and they fall asleep. And then Peter awakes suddenly and he's got a sword in his hand and he cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant. Commendably, he follows Jesus to the high priest's house where it's cold. He and John follow Jesus there where there's a charcoal fire and the night's cold and he warms himself but it's in the presence of that charcoal fire that he gets asked those questions. You're one of them, aren't you? You're from Galilee. And he denies it three times. No, I don't know the man. I don't know what you're talking about. And at one point he even erupts, swearing and cursing and denying completely. As soon as he had done that, the rooster crows and Jesus from a vanda, um, a higher point, turns and looks and eyeballs Simon and he eyeballs Jesus. And immediately he wells up bursts into tears and he runs out. I wonder what he was thinking. <clears throat> if only, if only I didn't go to the garden, if only I didn't have a sword, if only. Have you ever taken a plunge into a spiritual disaster, said something, done something that you've regretted immediately? Well, our worst sins need not be the end for any of us. Peter and this story certainly outlines that for us. Where was Peter on Good Friday, the very next day? We're not told. I dare say he's alone, he's isolated. But there were two events on that Good Friday that even he, in his aloneness, could not escape. The darkness at midday for three hours and then that earthquake that hit Jerusalem and tombs were opened. He must have felt this is the end of the world, this is God's judgment. Uh, my life is ending for the things that I have just done. But Friday passed and Saturday came and he was still here. It was not the end. He was filled with self-loathing and condemnation, reminding us that there is hope in the Lord Jesus, even for the worst offences that we are capable of committing. Then, of course, Jesus rose. And when he rose, the angels instructed the women, go and tell his disciples that he'll go before you to Galilee and tell Peter. He had a specific message on Resurrection Sunday. And in fact, that Sunday afternoon, the Lord Jesus appeared to, uh, to Peter, had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him. We have no details about that conversation, but I can imagine it's the correction, the apologies, the sorry, the confessions, all of that. And then there is this story in John 21. This is the third account that John wants to tell us about. And it's a remarkable story. Jesus appears, according to John's Gospel, this is the third appearance. Three times he says to his disciples, peace be with you. 
And Peter is present for each one of those occasions. He hears the Lord Jesus say, peace to you. And then, of course, they've gone fishing. And the passage tells us that... Oops. They'd gone out fishing. They hadn't caught anything. Jesus gives them instruction, let it down on the other side, and they do so, and they catch 157 fish. And they realise it's the Lord, and Peter puts his clothes back on, his coat, and he dives in the water, and he swims to Jesus. There'd obviously been some sort of restoration, reconciliation. He wanted to be the first to get to Jesus. And when they all got there, they discovered that there was a charcoal fire, there was fish already cooking, and some bread. A good, healthy breakfast the Lord Jesus is providing for his disciples. And it's probably worth just pausing for a second and noting Jesus' attitude and how he ministers to us at our point of need. He invites them to come and have breakfast. He is about to have a conversation with Peter. When they had finished eating, verse 15 tells us, when they had finished eating... That grabbed me during the week and I thought, how typical of the Lord Jesus. He ministers to us at our point of need. In this case, it's a physical need. They'd been up all night. They were obviously cold and probably and certainly hungry. And what does Jesus do? Provides a fire to warm them and food to feed them. And then he'll have the conversation spiritually. We are body-dwelling people and we do have physical needs. And God expects us to take care of our physical needs. If we're not right physically, if we're hungry or if we're tired or hot or cold or uncomfortable or whatever, then we'll be distracted spiritually. That's why I am never phased or worried if someone comes to church and they go to sleep during the service and they come to the end and they apologise. I am never embarrassed, I'm not upset. My answer is always, we minister to the whole person. If you've got a physical need, then you have a little nod. Now, that doesn't apply to anybody here this morning. But it just struck me that Jesus is caring for these guys, and particularly Peter, physically. And then we're going to have the conversation. He calls him Simon. Not his new name, Peter, but Simon. Simon means shaky unreliable one, shifty. Peter changed his name and called him Peter, which means rocky, solid, dependable. Jesus now calls him Simon. Part of a correction, part of a challenge. And Jesus has got a question for him. Do you love me more than these? Question, is this a conversation which is happening in the group in front of others? Certainly reads like that. And yet if you read down the passage, you get to verse 20, it says, Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. It seems to imply that Jesus and, John, uh, uh, Jesus and Peter had gone for a walk along the, the edge of the lake and that John was following them. If that's the case, can't be dogmatic then this is a private conversation that Peter's obviously going to relay to John, who was following him along. Jesus' question, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? Let's clarify what we think Jesus is asking him. There are a couple of possibilities. What do these refer to? Is it things? Do you love me more than these things? The boats, the nets, the fish. Is that what Jesus is asking him? Maybe. Some commentators certainly think Peter has gone back to his old way of life. I don't think that. But this view would certainly fit with that interpretation. Have you gone back to your old trade as a fisherman, your old occupation, your old way of life or your recreation? Peter, do you love me more than you love those things? Your job, your trade, your hobby? That's a good question for us. Do we love Jesus more than we love these things? Or do these 
referred to the other people. Do you love me more than you love them? When you look amongst the disciples who are with him, there was his brother, Andrew. There were his business partners, James and John. And the other disciples that were present there that day were his close companions for the last three years or so. Close friends who'd been through some tough times together. Jesus' question to Peter then is, do you love me more than you love your family or your business partners or your close friends? Whichever one is correct, and they're, I think, the only two options, whichever one it is, it's clear that Jesus is saying, do you love me more than, insert whatever you like after that, do you love me first? Because that's the way that he wants to be. Before all else, before everyone else, that's what he wants. That's the only love that will satisfy him. He wants to be number one, to be first, to be supreme. In this passage, we're going to discover how Jesus wants to be loved. Firstly, love him supremely. The question, is there any area of your life, is there any area of your life that's not surrendered to him? Probably. Well, he's challenging that. He wants all of you and he wants to be first. Is there anything God is wanting of you that you're withholding, that you're hesitating on, that you're not doing? If you don't love him supremely, then you're not loving him the way that he wants, desires and deserves. Do you love me more than? And that's what it means, supremely, submissively, entirely, with no withholding, no reservation, no hesitation. Do you love me more than your own agenda? And we could go on and just keep adding things. I think I told you a couple of weeks ago, and if I haven't, then I will this morning. I don't know, six weeks, maybe a couple of months ago, a while ago, uh, I was out shopping. Uh, Rhonda had released me and trusted me to go by myself. And uh, at this particular shop, there was a Royal Flying Doctor service. They were doing a fundraising thing. And so I filled in some papers and stuff. And while I'm doing that, the guy discovered that I was a pastor. And so then he asked me this question. He said, you're a pastor. How do you make God laugh? How do you make God laugh? It's a good question, isn't it? I didn't know. Wasn't sure what was coming next. And then he said, tell him your plans. <laughs> you tell God your plans. That'll make God laugh. Really? You think that's what's going to happen? Do you love me more than your agenda? Your plans? Well, Peter had denied Jesus three times. Jesus has said to Peter now, peace be with you three times. Jesus is going to ask him three times, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? Do you love me? Me? And do you love me? The third question. Each time Peter answers the question, Jesus gives him a job. This is the second way. Jesus wants us to love him actively. He wants us to be engaged and it's interesting if we love Jesus then we'll also love and serve and care for his sheep one another for his people in fact the way we treat one another is how we treat him and how we treat him is how we are to treat one another in verse 17 it says this is the third time Jesus said to him do you love me and Peter got hurt because it was the third time you know, asked and answered, Jesus, I've answered it. Or, don't you believe me? But Peter simply says, Lord, you know all that can be known. You know all things. You know that I love you. And if there is any emphasis in Peter's response, any hurt or frustrations, or if he's a bit short, you know, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus is undisturbed by however Peter responded and Jesus just says straight up, feed my sheep. 
Basically, I think Jesus is saying, stop focusing on yourself and your failure and look after my followers. Get over yourself, Peter. It's being dealt with. Jesus wants to be loved actively, not just by words, not just by statements, not just by singing in church on a Sunday. He wants us to back it up with actions, just like the Apostle John writes, Dear children, let us not love just with words, or speech, but with actions and in truth. And if Jesus tells you to do something three times, then he really does want it done, doesn't he? Feed my sheep, care for my lambs, feed my lambs. Just like we need to eat physically, so we need to eat spiritually. Just as an aside, not related to anything really this morning, but we went out for morning tea yesterday with our Bible class group. And when we had uh, dinner together in the cafe, uh, guess what we all did? Took out our phones and took photos of the food. Why do we do that? Did you know that on the studies show that there are 16 million photos of food on Instagram? 16 million photos of food. I'd say about 1 million of those are on Josh Tan's phone. <laughs> Chefs do it. Reviewers do it. The customers do it. Some restaurants these days now are banning phones in their restaurants. They don't want you taking photos of their food. They want you to eat and to enjoy the experience. Food is essential. We know that physically. But also spiritually. We don't live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Feed my sheep. So, Pastor Rob, you're a spiritual chef preparing meals for God's sheep. Jesus wants us to love him actively. That's our vision statement. Actively, it's committed to him every day, personally. Connecting with his people every week, church and connect groups and ministries. And confessing him publicly or being concerned for others at every opportunity. Sharing the gospel. Actively involved in demonstrating our loyalty to him. But Jesus also wants us to love him verbally. The truth of the matter is Jesus does know whether we love him or not. So why does he ask the question three times? Partly because it's to help Peter. Peter needed to say it, so do we. But I think also because Jesus wants to hear it. What is felt deeply in the heart needs to be expressed freely on the lips. We need to say it and we need to hear it. We need to say it, feel it, and show it and express it to one another. It's not just the words. It's the words linked with the heart. We all know that. I was so glad that Rob referred to uh, the fact that he's living with a married woman because I only have this Sunday and next Sunday to talk about Rhonda. I've been doing that for 20 years. I don't know what you're going to do. How are you going to keep up to date with the stories of what's going on for her? And so here's one for today. I've been in love with this woman. I've been married to her for only for 47 years. But I've been in love with her for 49. It was love at first sight. When she saw me, she was gone. <laughs> and I would say, not on every one of those days, but gee whiz, be very close to it. And it's not just once a day, it's two, three, and sometimes more times a day. It depends what you're doing and how often you're going home or leaving or phoning or, and all that stuff. So if I multiply 49 years, which is how long I've known her, by 365 and then add 12 days because they're the leap years, then it comes to 17,897. That's at once a day. Well, I reckon I've done it maybe three times. That's 53,690 times I've said I love you. 53,690. Surely that's enough. <laughs> I assure you it isn't. She'll want to hear it again tomorrow. 
day after day, and so do I. Not I love me, but that she loves me. Saying it yesterday isn't sufficient for today, is it? So does the Lord. He wants to hear from us that we love him. Love thrives on expression. If you could ask God just one question, I wonder what it would be. If God was to ask you one question, guess what it would be. Do you love me? That's what the Lord wants to know. We need to say it, feel it, and show it. God wants us to have, make a very honest evaluation of ourselves. That's how we are to love him, supremely, first, actively, and verbally. God invites us for an honest evaluation of our relationship with him. How are we with him? It reminds me that the church is not a museum for perfect saints, for people who are perfect and good and holy. Church is for a hospital for forgiven sinners, for people who are broken, who are wounded, who struggle. It's not about bragging and pretending that we are loving him more than we are. It's about being honest with ourselves and with one another and praying for one another and helping one another. I love this quote. Those who look up to admire the rain holos only end up with a pain in the neck. And they only end up being a pain in the neck. None of us are perfect, are we? That's why we need Jesus and his forgiveness. And he loves us and he wants us to love him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have his life everlasting, eternal life. We're going to pray together. Heavenly Father, grant to us by your grace to trust you, to seek your Son, our Saviour, and to be useful to you as your servants. Help us, Lord, to love you supremely, actively, verbally and to live for your praise and honour and glory. We ask and pray this in the name of Jesus. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. We're going to go and have morning tea together. Um, if there is some, I'm not sure that there is. If there is, it's burning. God bless everybody. Have a great week. See you tonight, 5 o'clock at Carol's.